JCConf 二零一八精彩议程，由 Soft Leader 松林科技保险核心系统领导厂商 ，OS 号召各路顶尖人才携手放眼亚太 ，Line 拉近你我的距离，赞助为您播出。Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome.、Um, my name is Jakub Nabrodalik, and if you want more details about me, there is a website, so I don't have to talk about myself and bore you to death. So you can just go there and see if, if you need any any of that.、Uh, from the perspective of this talk, the important information is that I use test-driven development since 2005, and I never looked back. And I made all possible mistakes. And, and I've learned from those mistakes. And right now, I work at the company where I do software development. As a, but also, I do a, a lot of workshops, and I help other companies and other teams learn how to do、uh, Spring or test-driven development, things like that. And what happens is that I see that、uh, different teams all around the world are doing exactly the same. People who just have exactly the same problems that I had, and make the same. Uh, errors that I did, so I thought I'm going to give you a talk about、uh, that is not going to solve all your problems, but like maybe perhaps most of your problems. So this talk is not going to be about the, all the different possible ways you can do test and behavior-driven development. It is not going to talk. I'm not going to talk about the philosophical part of the test-driven development. There is another talk for that, and it's much better. This talk assumes that either you are using test-driven development or you tried using test-driven development, and somebody promised you a, a very nice, like a trip with a, 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 with sun shining and, and everything is going to be beautiful, and then you feel like this, <laughs> and you're like, yeah, it was beautiful, except I feel some shit on my face, right? So, so it's not it's not exactly great, and let me walk through the most top.、Uh, Uh, most popular problems that people have、uh, with test-driven development and the errors that they make. So the most common error is that people think that test-driven development requires unit testing, and by unit testing they think that unit testing means testing classes and methods. Okay, and this is wrong. This is completely wrong because if you want to test in a normal project, if you want to test all the methods and all the classes, what happens is that Assuming that a single class has about two or three collaborators, and assuming that you have about it's a small project, let's say it's a microservice, 300 classes, then you will have 300 times three number of mocks that you would have to create to mock the behavior of other classes. And the problem at the very beginning is it doesn't look much, but it, it, it grows because what happens is that if you want to refactor any single class, there is a large chance that you will、uh, you will change the behavior and also you will change the signature there, and your mocks have recorded behavior. So, what happens is that when you change the behavior, you do any kind of refactoring, out of the sudden 500 tests break, because you just did small, small, a small change, right? But the mocks had already had recorded behavior, and so refactoring become very very difficult when you have when you are testing only classes and methods. And the other thing is that even if you have 100% of the test coverage for tests、uh, for methods and classes. You ship it to to production and it doesn't work. It breaks, right? Why? Well, it doesn't integrate together too much, right? So you still need integration tests. So th this brings us to the second problem because a lot of people have this kind of experience and they say, okay, so you know what? Let's not trust those those unit tests. Don't give us anything, right? Because they are just slow. They just slow us down when we want to refactor, and also they we have no safety because it fails on production anyway. And they do the opposite problem,、uh, the op opposite、uh, um, extreme, which is they all, uh, people test,、uh, tend to say, okay, so from now on we are only going to test using the integration tests, and integration tests are dead slow. And I I wouldn't be able to do any test-driven development if any of my tests would start would run for longer than one second, okay? And there is a scientific reason for that that I'm going to give you later on. And with、uh, the technologies that I use, I use Spring Framework a lot. 
uh, it's impossible to actually have it uh, run so fast because the, an empty Spring context actually on my laptop uh, starts in 3.5 seconds. And when you add an, uh, to a small microservice, when you add MongoDB, for example, and you start it in memory and you add some tests, then it goes into 22 seconds for a real microservice. And if it's not a microservice, but a large monolithical application, I have seen things you wouldn't believe. I have, I have seen tests running for 45 minutes or sometimes even longer than that. And uh, the record was that uh, test running for three months, but that's a completely different story. It's, it's a, you, there, there's no way out of this uh, at this point, right? So the question is, what should we test then? We cannot test everything on the integration level because it's too slow. And we cannot test on the, on the method and class level because we will not be able to refactor and it doesn't give us anything, right? And the a very simple answer to all of that is that you should test units, however, because it's called unit testing, right? However, your units are not your classes. Your units are, are your modules inside your application. So the question is, what are modules? Well, if you have any kind of a, a architectural diagram on, on, on the wall, right, explaining or you are trying to express and explain to, to somebody how your system looks like, then this most likely are your uh, modules, okay? Or sometimes they are uh, uh, called uh, components, for example. So here we have an, an example, and the, a module has got several things in, in, uh, which are very, make it very interesting. First of all, a module encapsulates all this data. We are way past the, the style of programming when there was like a lasagna style of programming, when you'd have different layers. You would have an, a web layer, then a logic layer, business layer, then the integration layer, or the may, maybe data access layer. We don't do that anymore. A, mod a module is a vertical slice. It's got all those layers inside of it, and it en uh, encapsulates its data, which means that it doesn't give away this data, okay? It only talks through the API. So, that means that it's very easy to test because you, you have to talk with it through the API and, and that's, that's all, right? If you want to think about it as a black box, it's very easy to test. And if you're using domain-driven design, then m most modules are uh, uh, their own bounded context quite often, right? So that means that the different names and different uh, verbs have different meanings inside each module, right? So modules have uh, uh, are not just a single class. There are a bunch of classes. Uh, sometimes they are implemented as a, as a package, for example. I do that. Uh, sometimes modules are microservices. Quite often, I found myself implementing a new microservice, but because uh, setting up a new microservice takes a, a bit of time, for example, not, well, right now I have automated that to 15 seconds, but before that it would take uh, one day. Uh, so I would actually create a new microservice as a module inside another microservice. And then if it grows, I would take it out and actually make it another application, a real microservice on its own, right? So these are the modules. And if you test your modules as black boxes, and if you test all flows and all the corner cases in milliseconds, then you are a happy test-driven user. And then, but then again, you still have to test the access layer, for example, to the database. Because if you want to stay in milliseconds, you cannot access I.O. That's, that's the only thing you cannot do, right? You have to keep, stay in the memory and, and in the CPU. So later on, you still have to uh, uh, check whether the SQL you're using or whatever else, actually uh, the, the, your application talks with the, with the database, for example, or with Kafka or with, uh, with uh, other uh, systems that are using I.O. So then you have the integration tests again, but only for the crucial parts, and only the crucial parts that bring money. Things can break, but if, it, if the user doesn't care about it, and it doesn't break the money flow, who cares? We will fix it later. So, so basically, uh, th that's my solution for it. And it is very natural and easy if you're using something called hexagonal architecture. OK, so how to do that? I will show you a simple, very simple example. This is a simplified example so I can make it in time. And we will write an application uh, that is handling uh, uh, movies. Like it's, you can basically rent a movie, right? So we got several modules there. And let's take the fir first one, which is like uh, just a repository of movies uh, responsible for just returning movies that, that are available. And when you do that, you want to write the system from the scratch, right? So you have to start using test driven development with a test. So here we go. We start with a test. I'm using a library called Spock. 
for testing because it's much better than JUnit. And what do I start with, right? I need to talk with this module. I need some kind of a class that will represent the module. But there is no class that represents the whole module. So what I do is I create a class called film facade, which is just an entry point for the module. Okay, but how do I create that? And if I create it by calling new, then I will have just a single class. And I want to have the whole module, which will have all the classes and everything inside of it, right? So I know that I shouldn't probably put it into constructor of new uh, uh, of film facade. So I'll create another class, which is called new film configuration, and ask it for a film facade of the whole module already configured. Now, so now I have something to talk with, right? Now I need two DTOs because uh, we have some data transfer objects that we're going to send to the module, and this, these will be two films. And then I can talk with this film facade, right? And for example, here, all I need to verify, all I need to do is get the, uh, get the movie out, get the film out, right? But I learn that to be able to take the film out, I first have to add the film in. Right? So this is a something that you wouldn't implement just because it, uh, the requirements do not say so. You could like insert it to, to the database. But here I do not have a database. I only have the module and I can interact it with it only through the facade. So I do that. Then I add another test, which is just uh, uh, returning a list of films. And another test for uh, when I have no films. And another test for all the corner cases. Okay. And after a while, what I get is I have several classes already created through those tests. So I have a film, film creator for creating the film because it's complex, film type, then film configuration, film facade. And I need some kind of a database, right? I need to be able to store the data somewhere. But the, here, I will have the in-memory film repository because I cannot go to I.O. The moment you touch I.O., the, the, this is the moment when your test gets slow. The, these are not unit tests anymore then. So how hard it is to implement an in-memory database? Well, it turns out you need only one structure, and this is a map, and that's it. So I'm, fancy, I'm being fancy here, so I'm using concurrent hash map, and I implement everything uh, uh, by hand, right? Why not stub or mock, for example? Well, because stub and mock is just recording the behavior. And here I have the whole implementation. It's so easy. My sister, who is not a programmer but a graphic designer, could do it, OK? So really, with, with your eyes closed, it's a hash map, you just add things to it and you take it out. It's very, very simple, right? But at this point, and at this point, I also have the class film configuration, which returns the whole module. And right now, it's just three classes. It's a very simple thing. But I have, at this point, re uh, verified my whole module, the whole business logic that I have, the idea about whether this module even makes sense or not, OK? And all these tests that I have here run in milliseconds. Now, I'm a Spring user. I'm a heavy Spring user. And there is nothing uh, from the framework of, uh, here, right? There is nothing about Spring here. So this is pure Java, nothing else. And this is how you have uh, the, the, the whole, all of your tests about the module and about the system in unit tests. Now, let's move into the integration part. We want to see whether we can talk with the real database, right? And whether we can talk with, through HTTP. So I'll add some HTTP tests to my Spring application. And then I have to implement the impl uh, integration part. So I'll create a film controller uh, with, with, with Spring film repository to talk with the database. And I only just need to declare the interface. And then I have my configuration. And then something strange happens. Here, the configuration class is responsible for creating the whole module. But now I will have two methods. One of those methods, the first one, uh, uh, is a film facade without any parameters. And this creates the in-memory version of the whole module that I can test in milliseconds. It doesn't touch the database, right? Now, the second one is the one that is going to be run in production. And then Spring is going to give me an access to the real database. And, uh, the database, and this is going to run slow. And this is the part that runs in the integration tests, right? So I have the same module configured twice. And have a look. The first method actually calls the second one because it's important that I need this module configured completely in the same way, except for the classes that touch the I.O. OK? This is the only thing that I need to change. And what would happen if I didn't, if I didn't do it? What would happen if I had just like this method and used that method in a unit test? Well, if you have that, and I've tried that, if you have that in a team and, and, and you're uh, using this approach and uh, you use this method, then what you have is you need to either create a mock 
or maybe even use the same in-memory film repository that we have created, but just handle it inside the test. And when a developer has sees the reference to a repository, to the database, he's not going to interact with the module anymore. He's going to insert some data there and see if it, it comes out, or maybe the other way, right? So the, uh, this, having just the reference to the I.O. part inside your tests makes you actually uh, test this as a white box looking inside of the module and not having those, in, uh, those, uh, um, uh, in th those classes, not having those references makes you test the behavior of the module, which is the behavior driven development, because you can only interact with an entry point, which is the facade for the, for the module. And also that makes it very, very simple for, for uh, unit testing the whole logic of everything, right? So this, by the way, is called hexagonal architecture, all ports and adapters, because you have everything inside pure Java, and then you add the I.O. part and the other fancy stuff on top of that, but you only add that in the integration test and in the production. You need test do not need that at all. So that was the first problem. And do we use mocks for anything then, right? Because you haven't seen a single mock in those tests or stuff. Well, actually you do. If, you, if your modules stuck with each other and they have direct de dependency, then what you should do is you should mock each module and inject that module to your module that you want to use. So for example, here, article module needs promoted article module and a reader module. And this is so that I can verify the interactions, of course, and this is okay because I treat each module as a separate microservice or a separate application that it should have its own tests. And I treat it uh, as, um, as uh, basically as a Unix tool, let's say. So I can have all, all those tests for those modules and I rarely need a test for this whole system just as with the distributed systems we do not do end-to-end -end testing. We test on production usually, right? So. This works very, very well, and you can take it a step further, because if you do not have direct connections between modules, but use like event sourcing, not event sourcing, but like uh, event bus, just to send messages with, uh, uh, with Kafka, with Spring, with whatever else, then you can build something called system of systems. And that system of systems is actually an uh, uh, each module having its own um, being completely independent from other modules. And the only thing that you will have to inject, or mock in this case, in your uh, tests, is the event bus, and that will be enough. So that's the first thing. This makes my test, I have like, let's say I have 400 tests, and then run, they run in uh, 3.5 seconds, okay? And this tests the whole microservice. I have several thousand tests, and they are still running under 10 seconds and I, I, I can verify my whole system very, very fast. And that makes uh, the programming very easy and pleasant, right? But that's not the only problem. That was the first problem. The second problem that I see a lot is that people are putting too much information inside their tests. So let me show you an example. This is a very simple test, which is technically correct, and that is, test, that is verifying whether if you have three images uh, in different categories, and you search by an image by a category X, you will get those images that are in the category X, okay? So a very simple test, but does it look good? It's like a lot of code, right? You have to read from top to bottom, you have to see, oh, Rambo, maybe it is important that this is Rambo, maybe it's not important that this is Rambo, what is it, right? And this is a real test from production, from, from, from code uh, at the company, right? And I looked at that and I talked with the developer and in, in, in about 30 seconds we have refactored this to that. And this is the same test with all the information that you need to understand, understand this test, but with all the information that you don't need omitted. And it makes it much easier to read. So here we needed a test for uh, um, images in different categories, and we have just created, extracted a method called in category, right? And that's all you need, and it makes it very easy to reason about and to read those tests. And the important thing here is that when, if you have too much information, it makes your uh, uh, life harder, not easier, right? So we should hide the information which is not relevant to the requirements. And it's very easy to do if you look at the requirements that you, you have, okay? And if you write like behavioral specifications, for example, so just like uh, how, how you're going to interact with the system, and don't put anything more than that. 
see if your tests in code actually look exactly like the, the, the minimal in, minimum information that you need to explain what the requirement is. And to give you a few examples, if I have a test and I need persisted films, I don't have to create a new film every each, and each time and save it to the database, whatever. I can have like a list of persistent films and say, Let, give me first. That's all, that's all, right? And this is in Groovy, so it's a built-in method for, for, uh, for a collection, right? And if I need a film of a certain kind, this is the, uh, I need a new release here, I can set, say, persisted, persisted films find the film of a new release, and that's it, that's it. I don't need to create a new film every single time, give it in a title, give it in a description, and all the information which is not required. And then if I need to have like an unpublished article, and it is a very difficult, not difficult, but it takes a, 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 a several lines of code actually to create an article because it's a complex structure and a complex object, then maybe I will extract the whole thing into a method and have a create unpublished article as a separate method, which will explain exactly what I want to have without all the de uh, uh, details that are um, clumsy and are hard to read, right? So then, I have for, uh, I'm trying to minimize the information. But another thing is that if you're testing modules, then it's very good to prepare data for your module on the very first test that you create, like the very good data. So what I mean by that is that if I need articles, I'm, I'm creating software, and I was actually working for three years uh, uh, for software for the um, uh, content management system. Uh, so if I needed to have a new article, I would create a method on the first day that would create me a good new article just so that I can reuse it and uh, longer um, later on in the tests. So if I need um, uh, an article which doesn't have a title, I do not create a new article without a title, but I reuse the same method and here just put the information which is required. And the same thing, for example, for uh, different properties. And for each module, I would uh, uh, we would find out actually that, that it makes a lot of sense to have the data for incoming data and the outgoing data, the correct data, prepared beforehand. It makes your life easier, but it makes it much easier to add uh, new tests and to write new tests for that. So this, by the way, the sample new article is uh, just a method that you can, because I'm using Groovy here for testing, uh, which is just getting a map and then uh, using a builder to create the object so that it's finally uh, 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 type safe. And the, the map itself, I usually use just a Groovy map so I can reuse that inside of uh, uh, web tests where I serialize this into the JSON because it's so simple and test the same thing in, inside the uni integration test, but only the crucial parts. And another thing is that for a lot of integration tests, there is a lot of uh, boilerplate code that n uh, you think that you need there. Like for example, if you need to test HTTP, then you would have to think, okay, I need to write a new test for, for what was the controller? Like what's the URL? What's the, what are the headers? What's, uh, what's, the, uh, what's the HTTP method for that? And people are adding all of this. And this, is, this looks like at least five lines. Sometimes it, it goes into 10 lines even. And, and, and it's being repeated all over and over in each test. And you have to think and search how does it work. So when you are writing a unit test, you're just testing against the facade. It's much easier, right? In integration tests, you can also help yourself a little bit if you extract those behaviors, the integration with your module through the HTTP, for example, into separate methods. So what I do is I, I usually have use uh, uh, groovy traits, which are just like, uh, um, just like interfaces with default methods, but they all can also have state in groovy. And I, I, I create those kind of behaviors, like here operating on article endpoint. So whenever you have tests that need to operate on articles, uh, on articles, you, need, you know that you can reuse this trait, and then your test will look like this. I have a test that needs a new article, so I will just use a method from that trait called post new article. And it only takes the minimal information required to create me a good article. If I need to update an existing article, that's the same thing. I, create, I reuse a method called update existing article, giving only the ID and the field that I want to change, and so on. 
And the uh, uh, important thing of this, I don't have, when I reuse those methods, I do not have to think about things like the HTTP method, the headers, the way, uh, how do I serialize this thing, how do I unserialize this thing, is it synchronous, asynchronous, and what's the endpoint, what's the URL, all these kind of uh, uh, questions. These questions are very, very important but only on the first test, only on the first implementation. Later on, when you're adding more tests and tests for coronary cases and everything like that, then you don't need, don't need it. And what it allows me to do, it allows me to go do something like this. This is an integration test that goes through the whole application, the main flow of the microservice, to, to make sure that we will earn money, okay? So the goal of the microservice is the, the management of the, uh, of articles so we can go through the whole thing and it doesn't look very long just because I have all the inter inter uh, actions with the module in the integration test extracted to separate methods. And then what, what is very easy, is very easy to write exploratory test. Let's see what happens if I now, if the user now updates something else and somebody else also updates that or, or maybe let's see what happens and so on and so on. If you extract this, then it's very, very, then it's, then it's that simple really. But all these techniques are, are, aren't as strong as the last one. This is a technique called, called uh, show don't tell, okay? And it comes from a realization about how we actually explain things to other people. So let's say that we wanted to write, you, want, you, have the, uh, I, um, you know the requirements, you know what should happen, and I'm a developer and I need to understand how it works or how it should work. And let's say that we write something very simple, like maybe we are managing a category of uh, the tree of categories in an internet shop, something like that, right? Which actually I did. So uh, how would you explain to me what it means to add a category to a tree of categories, right? Or to move a category in a tree of categories. So let me show you what was the first implementation that I found. The first one was something like that, okay? And it's a correct implementation, all right? It works. Uh, there, there is no uh, problem, there are no problems with logic there. The only problem is that it's a lot of code. And is this how you would, is this the most efficient way to explain the requirement? Maybe not, because when we were talking by the, uh, uh, with developers, when what we usually do, we, we have whiteboards. And we just take a, 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 a pen and start drawing on the whiteboard. And how would you explain adding a new category to a tree of categories. You would draw a tree of categories, right? You would put, say, okay, here I'm adding in this point uh, a new, uh, at this point you, I'm adding a new category, and you would uh, draw another tree of categories, or maybe you would just mark that it's, it's, it's there already, right? Something like that. And the question is, if the best way to explain something to another person in computer science is to use a whiteboard and draw something and talk, can we do the same thing in tests? And it turns out we can. So, how to, write such, how to write this test so it's much easier to understand and easier to spot all the problems, okay? First of all, we need to declare a tree. So let's declare a tree. Here you can see a tree. Where, what is the root of the tree? A, exactly. So you don't know the language, right? You don't know what's, what, what, is, what is it underneath, but it's very easy to understand that it's A, right? You don't need anything more. So you, this would be the only reason I am not right, uh, drawing it from bottom to top to bottom is because it's hard in Java, which is from left to right, right? That's it. So we have a tree. Then I need to add a category to a tree. So I'm, I'm creating something like I need a DTO for a new category. And I'm calling, OK, for C, I want to add to C. So I'm, I'm going to uh, go with C plus G at position 1, because I also have a position there, right? And then to verify what happened when I do it, because I need to now interact with the system, so now I interact with the facade, modify the tree, right? And then I want to see what happens next. And I also can just draw a, t, a tree, right? So now you can see that the, there is a G under C at position one, and that's it. So it's very easy to understand. You don't even have to be a computer programmer to understand this, how it works, right? And it's very easy to explain. So what on earth is this underneath? Right? Well, if you look at this, this are, is just a single class that I needed to create called category node, which has got all this A, B, C, D, E, and so on declared, right? As a static thing. So I just do not have to write new A and, and that's it. 
And a category node for me, well, if I want to represent the tree, the easiest way to do it is just to write an ID and the list of children, right? And that's it. That's all you need for the, the simplest possible solution. And then this whole thing A, and then uh, you, you got the parenthesis there, it's just a method called call in Groovy. And you have another uh, similar method in PHP, for example. You unfortunately don't, cannot do it in Java, but you would like uh, uh, probably make a dot and, and actually make a one letter or a few letters to just have a method. But that's, that's pretty much it. And it allows me, only this class, the simple class, allows me to represent the whole test that we have seen before, this one, in a way that is so simple to understand even, uh, well, my, my, my sister is quite smart, but uh, I don't know. My ma I could explain this, this to, to my grandmother, uh, most likely without any problems, and she haven't seen a computer ever, right? So that's very simple. And what happens is that, what, what is this part? C plus G. This is also very simple. This is just a method called plus, because in Groovy you have method overriding. Uh, not method, but uh, operation overriding. You cannot create new, uh, new, new, new appearance, but you can, you can override the existing ones, right? And uh, this is just a, an, another, uh, another method plus, and you have to create another class which will represent a category node at a position. And that's it. So we are creating a very small DSL. But what happens next is that it allows us to explore the requirements further. Because if now I had just one test and I need another test to move a category under another category, I can do exactly the same thing. I, have, I can create a tree of categories. Then I will say I need to modify the tree and I move, need to move the category B under category F. Okay? And now I invent another op uh, operator, which is just the right shift. It actually exists in Java and in Groovy, right? And I need to have the outcome, and that's pretty much it. So creating those one single class to represent the DSL for testing purposes makes all those tests very, very simple. And if you think that this is works only in ca the case of moving categories, then I have another example. Here, you can most likely see how the tree looks, even though this test is not about the tree. This is a test about uh, articles which are in some categories, and what happened to those articles when categories move. So now I do not have the categories themselves, the C1, C2, and C3, but I have a path. I have I created a single method called path, which will create me like a breadcrumb to a category, right? And if I want to move uh, categories and see what happens from the perspective of articles, I will create, let's say that we want to move some C2 under B2, then I will call from, which I will take the path to C2, because I want to move to C2, right? And I will create a new path too, which is C1, B2, C2, and now, that, now I will talk with the facade and actually update the uh, state. And I can verify that the current path for AC3, which I have articles in each of those categories, is C1, B2, C2, uh, C3, because I've moved that underneath, right? And then I can verify this for the AC2, which is in C2, and AC3 was b before it was, it was in th C3. And I have another method which just verifies that no other uh, articles were moved. So this is very simple to do no matter whether it's a tree or whether you are doing something more complex. And if you think this is just for the, like this kind of structures, uh, think of, I'll give you another example. Think about how do you, would you test where the car, if you, if you want to write an application that, sh let's say for car sharing. So you want to order a car just like in the Uber, but this time you're just renting the car, you need to find where it's located, right? So how would you write this test? And you can th say, okay, on a whiteboard, I would draw a map and say, the person is here, the car is there, and there's another car there, and if you search, you will find the closest one, right? So maybe drawing a, a, a map is an overkill uh, in ASCII art, let's say. But it turns out that when I was giving this uh, talk at uh, DevOps, a, a gentleman from TomTom, which is a company responsible for maps, said, uh, came over to me and said, you know what, we are drawing maps in our tests but only as a documentation in ASCII art. But what I would do, if I, I wanted to implement that, so what I would do is I could do something like that. Instead of doing something complex, I would say, I would create one uh, method called car, which would have a position, x and y, right? And it doesn't matter whether these are kilometers, there is an absolute position, it doesn't really matter that much, right? Because we only need it for reference. So I'm creating four cars, A, B, C, and D. And I register the location, 
and uh, register those cars as well. And I make only two of them available, A and B. And when a user searches for a car from some posi position, right, and I use position 00, zero because it's easy, then when I, the cars that I have found would be B and A because these are the closest cars. And again, you don't have to actually understand programming to understand how it should work, right? And there is another thing. I was giving this presentation in, uh, in, in, in one city in Poland, and a gentleman asked me, like, do you know that you have an error there? I was like, how is it possible? He said, have a look. You have two physical cars parked under the same coordinations, right? Shouldn't they be like clashing? Well, of course, the GPS has got some kind of, you know, maybe one meter or three meters. They, they could stand close to each other, right? But just having this test, not in like a block of code, but in, in this visualization allows a person who never seen that before to realize that there's something going wrong or maybe he needs to ask questions. So this type of uh, um, uh, working with a whiteboard actually helps a lot in reasoning about the system. So this approach is very, very simple, and I uh, highly recommend it, is to just think, when you need to write a test for a module, think, how would you explain that to me on, uh, with a whiteboard? And maybe if you draw something and you can see that you can explain in a different way in, in the code, then make, maybe you can make the code look exactly the same or using the same things that you have drawn on the whiteboard because it make, makes it much easier for you uh, to understand it and to use it, right? And this creates a domain-specific domain language. So by just two classes, five, five simple methods, we have created a domain-specific language to test our module. Don't be afraid to do that. I, once I thought that the, creating a new domain-specific language is uh, something very difficult or you have to think through or you have to really consider whether the complexity is okay and whether it's actually worth it. No. Think about it this way. If you, are, if you were learning mathematics, for example, all the mathematicians, what they do is they first try to create an, an, a language where the uh, explaining of the problem would be so simple that the solution would be obvious. Okay? That's what they do. It's better to actually have a very simple, create a new very simple language where everybody can see right away what's going on and understand the behavior than to try with a language, which is a general purpose language, to invent the uh, expression uh, to that so that, you know, so that it works basically, but it's hard to understand. Uh, so the clue here is this. Simplify the tests, make them make them with only the information which is necessary to understand. Take everything out so that the picture is clear, clear, crystal clear. And it's so simple as here. Here, you, you, there is not a single object which would make you not understand that this is just a gentleman attacking a river with an axe. Very simple thing, right? So n all the other things are completely taken out. And do the same with test. Remove all the clutter. And if you think about the DSLs, then some people will, uh, I don't know if you use Cucumber or JBehave here, but some companies are actually using doing that. And th they say that, well, if this is a DSL, then we can use just plain English, for example. And there are tools that allow you to test using plain English. The thing is that those were invented for a different reason. Uh, things like JBehave and Cucumber were, were invented so that the business people could read those tests understand those tests, write those tests, and basically execute them, right? Now, after using the uh, test-driven development since 2005 and seeing how it works in different companies, I have never seen a company where the business people would like to write a new test just because they, have in just, uh, you, they can use only English language and they don't, don't have to use any programming language. Why? Well, it's very simple. Business people are not trained in logic. They're not thinking logically, okay? Uh, the, the whole world, the business world, is very complex and chaotic, okay? So it doesn't really fit to our kind of thinking. And we are trained in thinking in a logical way. So for us, it's much easier. So usually what would happen is that the business people would call me and tell me exactly what they want to have instead of writing this. So all those tools, I've, uh, to, to, right now I find no use for them uh, because just the main purpose of business being able to explore and test and, and write didn't work uh, really well, okay? Now, uh, there is one more thing because people are, if you, what if you have a lot of integration 
libraries and, and uh, technologies there. So once I had like a microservice which was using MongoDB, Elasticsearch, S3 AdWords, Kafka, and whatnot. And if you th think about all of this, if you want to test this inside an integration test, this is going to get very, very slow because there is so much I.O. going on in here, okay? And you need to start all those, no, maybe not all those things, but, but you can start Kafka maybe in a Docker and MongoDB, well, in memory actually works, and Elastic and maybe in a Docker and so on and so on. So when you think about it, this has to be slow. So what can you do to make it faster? And there is actually a very simple solution to that. When you have to think about what is the important library, what changes the most for me, okay? And in my application, that was the MongoDB. Whenever I was changing the code, I would have something to do with MongoDB. So once a week, I would change the, something in the MongoDB. But with the Elasticsearch and Kafka and so on, I would touch it once a month, maybe, or once two, per two months, okay? So the solution was very simple extract the, 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 the whole API of those libraries, the, the whole, uh, treat them as jars, basically move them to a separate jars, test them there, and just include them in your projects. So treat them as a tool which is already tested. So you will have those slow tests for Kafka, but they will be in another library. And when you change your code, and you, when you build, every time you build, you are not paying the price of five minutes just to test the connection to Kafka, which, by the way, didn't change because you didn't do anything, right? There, anything new. So this is my summary for you. Focus on testing modules using the hexagonal architecture. Uh, test the behavior, as, uh, so test your modules as black box, not the implementation. Prepare a sample test data for each module because you are going to reuse it and other developers would like to reuse it. Hide the API for the integration tests under meaningful methods so that it's easier to understand and use. Build a small DSL to express your requirements. Just think about how you'd uh, explain this on using a whiteboard and extract the code that runs slow inside your integration test to a separate libraries and test those things out there. Because your budget time is very, very small. Uh, I said that I wouldn't be able to do it if my test would take longer than a second. And the reason for that is uh, there was a research in, in 1993 by Jakob Nielsen uh, who did the research that if something takes longer than a second, you start to notice that it takes longer than a second. If it's long, uh, shorter than a second, it doesn't really matter. But it's longer than a second, it breaks a, thought, a flow of thought. And then, if it takes longer than 10 seconds, you are bored. So if, so if you have to wait for a website for 10 seconds, you're not going to wait for that website, okay? The same with tests. If your tests take longer, you're not going to like your tests. And then there's another research in Sabre uh, in Krakow uh, that if tests take longer than three minutes, developers stop uh, firing them and just just push the to the repository and Jenkins will will fire it up maybe and tell me later on that I have a bug and it's this uh, makes the um, feedback cycle very very long so don't do that okay so thank you very much and if you have any questions because we are out of time I suppose or oh, do we have time for questions no we don't have time for questions so you can catch me on on, on a break thank you <laughs>